places 7 to 9 Celsius first thing. Towns and cities 10 to 13 Celsius and actually temperatures will rise through the morning and as those temperatures rise the cloud will bubble up and we'll see further lively showers developing, particularly northern England, parts of southern and southeastern and eastern Scotland. Further showers to come in places on Saturday, fewer on Sunday. The weather looks drier and more settled next week. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Stay for the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. Hey, welcome along. I mentioned this with uh, vaccine victim Anthony Shingler on, uh, I think it was Monday's show, yesterday's show, uh, but I don't want to underplay it. Ladies and gentlemen, head for the hills. The COVID is back in a devastating new variant targeting Britain's favourite telly presenters like uh, Jeremy Vine. Sore throat. Headache. <coughs> Cough, aches and pains, and a Joy Division T-shirt. So I'm in bed with it, with it, with COVID. Previously, years gone by, I would have come into work with this. You can walk, you can work. But obviously, that's not possible now. Going by our show, out of the presenters, 100% of our presenters have got it. That means, that me and Storm. That means there must be a lot of it about, why isn't the government mentioning it? Why isn't the government saying anyone vulnerable, you know, stay indoors? Look at my tent. That's a big red line. Uh, is there a BAFTA award for worst acting performance? That was uh, super darling, but can we just have another take? Uh, just a little more croak and uh, try to work on your uh, pillow munching. Uh, this is Jeremy Vine. I was supposed to be doing a voiceover today for Curly Whirly, but I may have to postpone it for a day or two. I bought an apricot flapjack at the tube station and I thought I'd got one of the crunchy bits stuck at the back of my throat, but it turned out to be the deadly new COVID strain, the Omicroak variant, like a bat out of Wuhan. Why isn't the government talking about this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, oh, no, I'm coming down with it. <laughs> I'm all getting all... Quick, quick, pass, pass me the ginger growler. Oh, thank God for that. Social, bring back the masks and the social distancing. Jeremy Vine is croaking.
not, you know, seriously croaking. He's just a bit croaky. The economy, and he wants the government to be talking about his croak. The economist totaled, the supply chain wrecked, entire industries that require anything more than literally dialing it in with pillow munching selfies are gone forever. The National Health Service has been reduced to the world's most expensive Zoom call. Every baggage handler at Heathrow has been stricken with sudden early retirement syndrome. We have the worst inflation since the 70s. Granny dying alone, unsurrounded by tiresome loved ones. A generation of children so psychologically damaged that there'll be suicidal depressives or uh, asbos on steroids in a decade. Mysterious increase in stillbirths in Scotland and Ontario. Collapsed birth rates in Germany and Norway. Perfectly healthy teenagers dying in their sleep. Athletes in the peak of condition dropping dead on the pitch. Justin Bieber with a semi-paralyzed face. So he can't go Biebering around to all his believers. We have half a million of Jeremy Vine's fellow citizens reporting adverse vaccine reactions, thousands dead of Guillain-Barre syndrome and other once rare diseases, and it's still not enough for the psychos of the group Think Media. There's still maybe 4% of normal life that isn't totally screwed. But maybe one more lockdown will do the trick. Jeremy Vine's triple jab, maybe more, and he's munching the pillow all night long. Maybe the government isn't talking about it because they know all the measures that you pom-pom girls of the propaganda media pranced about supporting up to the hilt have all utterly failed. I'm not sure... Mr. Vine has ever talked about the hundreds of thousands, maybe more, of hitherto healthy, young and middle-aged Britons now unable to work or to drive, having to sell homes to pay their medical bills. It's not as pressing as a touch of the croaks to him. Why isn't the government talking about me being croaky? Meanwhile, in totally unrelated news, do you know the Canadian comedian Nick Nemeroff? Here he is in hospital. I will not get the third shot. I will not. Pfizer me once, no shame. Pfizer me twice, shame on COVID. Pfizer me three times, shame on you. You want me to get a third shot, what's next? A fifth shot? No, thank you. Nick Nemeroff, uh, under the weather, in Montreal. Uh, we'd ask him on the show, but he's dead. 32 years old, cause of death unknown. He croaked big time, not like Jeremy Vine's crappy croak. Uh, there's a lot of that about, and we'll talk about it later. Plus a few other things the government isn't talking about. The near total failure of British policing, the psychologically unhealthy habit of importing people who hate your society and its entire cultural inheritance, the terms of reference for the COVID inquiry, and lots more. GB News is the people's channel, so we like to hear what you think. You can email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk, or tweet me at GB News. All that headed your way after Polly Middlehurst with the latest headlines. Mark, thank you. The top stories tonight on GB News. Boris Johnson has called Russia's president evil as he met with fellow NATO leaders in Spain. In an exclusive interview with GB News, the Prime Minister said Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine was unwarranted aggression against the innocent population. He made the comments as NATO agreed a fundamental shift which will see it return to Cold War-style readiness to respond to the increased threats from Russia. What he has done is evil, and is he I think himself evil? Do you reckon? Uh, you know, I think it probably follows that uh, if if you you know you, you you are what you do, then certainly you know he's. Uh, it's been an appalling act of unwarranted aggression against an innocent population, and you know, it's very rare in in life, in in politics, in diplomacy, when you see something that is so absolutely black and white, something so clear. 
Darren McCaffrey talking to the Prime Minister earlier. Well, in other news today, the sole surviving member of the group behind the November 2015 Paris attacks has been found guilty of terrorism and murder charges. Salah Abdesalam was seen as a key suspect and participant in the gun and bomb attacks that killed 130 people. Sentences will be announced later, but prosecutors have requested that Abdesalam receive a rare full-life prison term. The trial is the biggest in modern French history and began last September. Here, a royal source says the Prince of Wales would never again handle large cash donations for his charities. For the first time, a senior palace source has responded to reports that emerged at the weekend that Prince Charles was handed €3 million Euros in cash in a bag by a Qatari sheikh. Well, Clarence House has said the money was passed immediately to Prince Charles Charities and all the right processes were followed. The Court of Appeal has ruled the decision to end life support treatment for a 12-year-old boy should be reconsidered. Earlier this month, the High Court judge concluded Archie Battersby was dead and said doctors could therefore lawfully stop providing treatment. But his parents appealed the decision, saying their son's heart was still beating. Three Court of Appeal judges have ruled now there should be another High Court hearing for which a date hasn't yet been set. You're up to date on TV, online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News, where now it's time for Mark Stein. As Polly was uh, just mentioning there, the sole surviving suicide bomber of that Paris attack in 2015 has just been convicted in a court in France. I actually visited his flat in uh, Molenbeek in uh, Brussels uh, when he was in hiding and they, nobody knew where he was and they didn't know and they were scouring the earth to get hold of the guy, Salah Abdeslam. He was actually living behind the central police station in Molenbeek and uh, having coffee every morning in the little coffee place in the square and getting his shopping and all the rest of it. He was just behind the police station and they couldn't find him, which is kind of our theme tonight. Jeremy Vine was demanding to know, as is the way with the solipsistic narcissists of our media, why the government isn't talking about his sore throat, why the government isn't producing a white paper on his croaky voice, why the government isn't locking the country down because of his slight uh, vocal tickle. Well, the government isn't talking about, uh, this may stun you, the government isn't talking about Jeremy Vine because it's too busy talking about Vladimir Putin. Boris Johnson says Putin only invaded Ukraine because of his, quote, toxic masculinity. If Putin was a woman, which I, he obviously isn't, but uh, if he were, I really don't think he would have embarked on a crazy macho war of, of invasion uh, and violence in the way that he has. If, if you want a perfect example of toxic masculinity, it's, it would, it's what he's doing in, in Ukraine. You know, I get that after 12 years of supposed conservative government, there's not a jot or tittle of conservatism to show for it. But I wish at the least so-called conservatives could at least be bothered to talk like conservatives. Toxic masculinity is leftist framing. And if you take it seriously, it refers not to Vladimir Putin launching wars, but to say, ooh, selfish, opportunist men who shag anything that moves and then, should anything unfortunate result, talk the bird into getting an abortion. Just saying, Boris. However, if we are now to define toxic masculinity as walking uninvited, into somebody else's country, then what about all those strapping young lads arriving on England's southern shore every night of the week? Because unlike Ukraine's borders, Captain Butch Boy, the UK's borders are actually your responsibility. And speaking of toxic masculinity, what about all those towns up and down the land, Rotherham, Telford, Rochdale, Oxford, Oldham, Aylesbury, Banbury? where industrial-scale gang rapists rape English girls, serve if they're very unlucky, three years in jail, and then, as we reported last night, avoid deportation by renouncing their Pakistani citizenship. So they're strolling their old beat 
running into the girls they gang raped and urinated on and dangled off balconies. Fortunately, the girls are now 16, 17, so they're a bit long in the tooth to attract the gang rapists' attention. But even so, unlike Putin, uh, that toxic masculinity is your responsibility. Matter of fact, if you're so concerned about toxic masculinity, how about doing something about general police lethargy on sexual assault? The median time to lay a charge in a rape case in England and Wales has increased sevenfold from 70 days, that's a little over two months, to 465 days, that's over a year and a quarter. Only 3% of sexual offences result in even a charge or summons. So if your tastes run to sexual assault, you've got a 97% chance of being entirely untroubled by Her Majesty's Constabulary. On Sunday in Ilford, East London, a young lady called Zara Alina was 10 minutes from her home when she was attacked. Miss Alina was robbed, then raped, then murdered. And I was struck by this line from a statement put out by Miss Alina's family, quote, Zara believed that a woman should be able to walk home. And she's right. Once upon a time in London, a woman could walk home, but not now. As I always say, Britain is the land where everything is policed except crime. Cressida Dick has gone, but her wretched police force staggers on very much in her image and yesterday, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary announced the Metropolitan Police would be put under so-called special measures because of, quote, critical shortcomings. I was struck by this one. You know that if your house gets burgled, it's all but impossible uh, to get a copper to come round. But at least you can always call their 24-hour customer service helpline and it'll ring out at their answering machine in the South Sandwich Islands. And assuming the cassette hasn't run out, you can at least leave a message about the burglary and it will therefore get recorded in the national crime statistics. Whoa, whoa! Don't make any such assumption. Greater Manchester Police was placed under special measures because it failed to report 80,000 crimes. Same thing now with the Met. Uh, they've failed to report, I think it's 69,000 crimes. So when we're told officially that only 6% of crimes result in a charge or a summons, the real figure may in fact be even lower. Let me know your take on British policing, GBviews at gbnews.uk. Palm Sandu is former chief superintendent of the Met and author of the splendid memoir, Black and Blue. And uh, we always appreciate her insight. Palm, uh, most people watching won't actually know what Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary is. So is this actually a serious, meaningful sanction on the Met or just a little bit of accountability theatre? I actually think it's a, a welcome intervention and, uh, and it can actually produce some results because... The Met have been found, as you've just quite rightly said, they haven't been answering the 999 calls, they've not been um, dealing with vulnerable victims, they haven't been going to burglaries, and they've been not been recording the crimes. So it's, a, it's an intervention that's needed, but I do think that it could make a difference because the Met have to look after their communities, they have to look after the people of London. And if you're not doing basic crime work, then what are you doing? So I, I actually welcome that intervention and I feel that it could result in some changes. It's tempting to think that with the rise in crime, the police are just overwhelmed. But, but one of the reasons why this action has been taken, as, as we spoke about a few months ago, when you look at some of the texts and private communications between policemen at Charing Cross Station, there does seem to be a... Uh, to put it at its mildest, a fairly heartless and vulgar uh, attitude to the crimes that are afflicting Londoners. And, and policemen bantering about, you know, raping yeah. uh, their, uh, their suspects and witnesses as if it's all just a big laugh to them. It's not just that. It's the inquest that was held this week, which was around the four young men that were killed by Stephen Port. Now, no amount of changes in legislation, no amount of changes in any way, shape or form could have resulted in such a botched investigation. They didn't even send off 
you know, stuff for forensic education. They didn't look at the notes that were, there was a note supposedly written, a suicide note. They didn't even compare the handwriting. Mm. Now, that's not about legislation. That's not about giving police more powers. That's actually using the powers you've got look, to look after your community and look after the people that you have a duty of care to. And that's where the failures are. And those failures have come right from the top where the leaders haven't dealt with this core of officers who shouldn't be police officers. And Mark, I've got to say it, the majority of police officers are good, caring individuals who are there for the right reasons. And my heart goes out to them and also the communities of London. Well, we, we, we do, we always hear that, that it's, it's just a few bad apples. Harvey Proctor, who was on this show, and as you know, this was the absurd investigation, totally faked up by some weird fantasist that Scotland Yard fell for, that ensnared all kind, not just prominent figures, but relatively ordinary fellows like uh, Harvey Proctor, who was just like working as a kind of social secretary for the Duke of Rutland. That's not a big time job or anything. So his life was ruined. He lost everything. He says we need a royal, he, he thinks the entire sense of policing as established by Sir Robert Peel 200 years ago is now so off the rails. We need a royal commission to look at what police should be, what they should be doing, how it should be organised, and we need to go back to scratch. You know, when you say that there's a few bad uns or a few wrong uns, no, it's more mm. than that. There's a, there's a central core of people who shouldn't be in the job. And mm. even like um, Wayne Cousins, he was known as the rapist. He was allowed to transfer into the Met. Now, with the HMIC FRS, they can actually take action against the Met Police. They can hold them to account. So, but, but, you know, to do that, you have to admit you've got a problem. Now, if you're going around saying we're not homophobic, we're not racist, we're not sexist, we do go to burglaries, we do deal with online child abuse then you're not going to look for the solutions. And that's what the problem is. They're not looking for the solutions because they're not admitting they've got a problem. And at the moment, there's a vacuum in that leadership. And they've got somebody, Steve House, who's holding the fort, who came from a failing police service in Scotland because he was the guy who was in charge when the young couple were left for three days in a car before one of them died in hospital after being found three days later. So you've got this, these people moving around who are not actually making the right changes. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, it's astonishing to me how it even the <laughs> guy uh, from... No, I, I, no I, I take it as true, but I'm, I'm astonished, for example. But just to go back to the whole sexual offences thing, uh, you know, clearly in certain towns, in uh, across the, every corner of the country, we've had these horrifying stories of rape gangs allowed to operate with impunity for years on end. They're all friends with the coppers. In Oldham, we just heard they, pick, they picked up the 12-year-old girl in the lobby of the police station. You know, so the police station is where you go to find 12-year-old girls. And we've had all these stories. But the, the Charing Cross incident in London suggests that even when they're not nodding and winking at the at, at industrial scale gang rape, there is a general culture of sexism. Your book suggests that's true, so that the whole thing seems to operate on a continuum of kind of heartlessness to the sexual assault of the most vulnerable. One of the, the biggest points is that when officers are brave enough to call out inappropriate behaviour by their colleagues, they are then made to suffer. They are the ones who are sent to Coventry. They're the ones who are penalised, mm -hmm. victimised, because there isn't a safe environment to actually say, well, I think mm -hmm. that it, that guy over there is acting, he, he's wrong, he's, what he's doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. There isn't that mm -hmm. safe environment. Mm -hmm. And instead of dealing with those issues, they start blaming the person who is brave enough to stand up to it all. And that's the culture. That's one of the cultures that needs to change in the Met. And when you are investigated, you're investigated by your mates. It's somebody who might have been working with you yesterday yeah. who's now part of the complaints yeah. team. So there's no independence mm. of that, that investigation. And when you look at these organisations such as HMIC, I do believe that they can make a difference. 
And I do believe that they, if they hold the Met to account and there's other forces as well, they could actually improve policing because without trust and confidence, it's like, would your, would your nan pick up the phone and, and ring up and say, can I have some help, please? Because she's going to be listening to all these stories mm. and thinking, now, which one am I going to get? Am I going to get a good one or am I going to get one of the bad ones? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a very good way of, of putting it, Palm. Thank you very much. We will see whether this HMIC thing turns out to be uh, something real. But uh, there is a crisis in British policing, I think, and it needs to be addressed in, in some fundamental way. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Always great to see you. Uh, up next, your take, GBviews at gbnews.uk. Plus, Terry Wilcox on the vaccine inquiry. Jamie Jenkins on births and deaths and Alexandra Marshall on the kind of immigrant we've all been thrilled and waiting for. Don't touch that dial, we're coming right back. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. GB News is the people's channel, so let's hear the voice of the people. We uh, polled, we did a little Twitter poll uh, asking, have you lost faith in British policing? And here are the results. Have you lost faith in British policing? Uh, yes, 84.5%. No, 15.5%. So 84.5% of poll respondents have lost faith in British policing. I'm stunned by that result. I can't believe it's as high as 15.5% who still have faith in British policing. Are you all drunk? Are you all on drugs? Are you all uh, coppers with nothing to do sitting, uh, sitting around uh, the police station? Uh, f why do 15.5% still have faith in British policing? Jules says... The Met Police is on its knees, quite literally, at BLM protests. So how about, as a special measure, they focus on solving crimes rather than being weak and woke? That's true. Policemen shouldn't be taking the knee. It's pathetic, that kind of virtue signalling. Absolutely pathetic. Uh, you're unfit to be a policeman if you're taking the knee. Fatbury says, too many cuts by the Tory government. Uh, not true, actually. The police have plenty of money. Uh, they use it to sit around monitoring your tweets all day. So if you misgender someone, or if during the next lockdown that that uh, Jeremy Vine wants, uh, you're seen to be having a cup of tea with a couple of friends in your back garden, they'll have plenty of men and resources to send round 
and if necessary, batter your door down to make you cut that out. They're just, they'd rather do that all day. Uh, they, what, what was, what's the famous, sl the slogan of Her Majesty's most famous police force, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The Mounties always get their man. That's old school policing. Now the Mounties get you because it's a lot easier. Uh, Rich says, they're no longer the nice people who would clip you on the air if you did wrong. No longer a police service, but a police force. I had the pleasure of uh, living in a small community with one policeman. And when the kids would just be trying to be annoying, like they'd be cycling around the village green over and over and over and over and over again, the policeman would just eventually just tap one of them on the shoulder and say, that's enough, Sonny and he'd go home. Happy times. Our police force has become an embarrassment, said John. I've actually lost faith in the country. Helen says it depends. If you're pulling a statue down or spray painting a building, they'll bring you tea and sandwiches. But if you have the audacity to use hurty words, they come at you with baton. Yeah, let's not forget. Uh, they come at you with batons drawn. The thin blue line has become a rainbow promenade. Do you remember that tweeter? He'd advertised for a... He was a pornographic movie actor, and he'd advertised uh, for a woman to appear in a pornographic movie with him, and he got a response from uh, a trans woman who was uh, still packing a little extra, if you know what I mean. Uh, and uh, he didn't want to go there, didn't know what he'd be getting into. And that pornographic movie actor, they came, the police came round to investigate him for his transphobia in not wanting to have sex on screen with a woman uh, still packing the meat and two veg. That the police are happy to devote hours of time to. Uh, Mabel says, when I reported I'd been sexually assaulted, they made me feel like it was my fault. The person spent a short time in prison. And we hear that over and over again from Rotherham and from Rochdale and from Oldham and Telford and everywhere else. The way the police think that the women they write off as, quote, white slags or, quote, packy shaggers are to blame for their misfortunes. A couple of months back, GB News started interviewing victims of the vaccines. That's to say people whose husbands and fathers took the COVID shot and then died. You know Vicky Spitt and Charlotte Wright and Kelly Hatfield and Joe Ward. And we've also interviewed people who are permanently crippled by the vaccines. And a week or two after we started doing that, Baroness Hallett, the chair of the official inquiry, asked the PM if the dead and the injured from the vaccines could be included in her investigation. Well, we now have the answer, I think. This inquiry is going to cost £14 million per year and is expected to take four years, uh, by which time we'll all be dead, either from the Tuvalu variant of the Uzbek variant of the Ascension Island variant or from the 157th booster shot. Uh, Terry Wilcox is a solicitor who's representing various people with respect to the COVID inquiry, and he joins us now. Uh, Terry, good to see you. Is the Baroness going to uh, investigate the uh, vaccines and their impact on hundreds of thousands of people? The terms of reference were approved yesterday, Mark, which includes the impact of therapeutics and vaccines. So in answer to your question, yes, she will be investigating um, the effect of the vaccines, both positive and negative. And do you think uh, there will be real results from this inquiry or is the idea just to kind of push it? Because you, you've been involved with a lot of serious big time inquiries. Uh, you're involved with uh, cases arising from the Ariandi, Ariana Grande bombing in uh, Manchester. Uh, this, is, this would seem to be much bigger than that. It's not geographically and numerically contained in the same way the Ariana Grande thing is. This is going to be the, probably the biggest public inquiry in British history. Uh, it involves the devolved governments. It involves the national government. So it will be the biggest public inquiry in history, I think. It will take several years. So, so the Baroness will not only be investigating... Chris Whitty and co in London, but but she's also going to have to go to Belfast and Edinburgh and figure out what the devolved governments were up to as well. 
one of her promises yesterday was that she will be traveling around the country. It's not geographically centric. It's not a London issue. It's a national issue. And so because of that, she will be traveling around the country, interviewing people, questioning people, um, and producing her reports accordingly. Do you, do you agree with that estimate of four years as the likely time this is all going to take? I think she's already indicated that oral evidence will not be heard until next year at the earliest. So if it begins next year in earnest, then the scope of the inquiry will take several years to conclude. Um, I worked on the Hillsborough inquest and we were told initially that would take six months. That took two years. Mm. So if this one is in anticipated to be 18 months, two years, then I would say double it. I, I wouldn't have any issue with doubling any estimate, estimate of time. What do you expect to be the results of it? You've got various clients uh, who are concerned about various aspects of things, the, the decisions that were made to so-called care homes and all the rest of it. What, what kind of uh, results do you expect to come out of this inquiry? I, th I think the scope of the inquiry lends itself to having lots and lots of lessons to be learned, to use the parlance of the inquiry experts. Mm. The scope includes the financial implications to the country, lockdowns. So politically, it's going to be dangerous for certain people. Um, it's going to include the effect on individuals, the effect on different communities within British society. So it's going to have a wide ranging effect. So it's going to have multiple reports and multiple effects um, on every possible aspect of the pandemic. I was just mentioning uh, a couple of minutes ago the, the various rape gangs operating in uh, Rotherham and Oldham and uh, every, you know, every month, six weeks we get some report or other on that that uh, well-meaning people have done. The reports say the same thing that the previous report says, but there isn't actually any real action taken to ensure that the activity under investigation stops. Uh, are you concerned that this could be uh, another of those useless inquiries? We have suggested in the Manchester Arena bombing inquiry, the Ariana Grande concert that you mentioned earlier, we have mentioned mm. that there should be a monitoring um, group set up within government, which actually monitors the recommendations and ensures that they are enforced. Because once the chairman of the inquiry delivers her report. The inquiry is at an end. And so there's no power for Baroness mm. Hallett to then come back and say, what's happened to these recommendations? If there's a monitoring organi mm. organization being set up, then at least there is some teeth and somebody to actually check the government and hold them to account at a later stage. Because at the end of the day, it's the government who have asked for this. They've asked for recommendations to be made. And it is, it's for the government to actually enforce mm. those recommendations at a later date. Well, uh, it's certainly important because as Dr. Ted Ross and Joe Biden and all kinds of other people have told us, uh, apparently they're going to be second and third and fourth pandemics coming our way uh, any day soon. Thank you, Terry. It's good news that the victims of the vaccine will be included within the remit of this uh, inquiry, so keep us posted. We're going to have more on fallout from the COVID years in just a moment with Jamie Jenkins. Any country will always have a proportion of persons who entirely despise its history and culture. You know that if you take a casual stroll around your own neighborhood. But precisely because of that, it seems superfluous to requirements to import people from elsewhere who despise your history and your culture. Yasmin Abdel Magid is an Australian media personality. She was born in uh, the Sudan just after the usual military coup in that benighted land. And so her dad, having had the good fortune to earn a PhD in electrical engineering from Imperial College London, scrammed with his family to Brisbane, where Yasmin grew up and prospered. 
uh, in the Australian media until Anzac Day in 2017. Anzac Day, as you know, is when Aussies and Kiwis honor their war dead. The men who gave their lives to help preserve an, as an Australia that Yasmin's mum and dad thought worth fleeing to. But instead, she took the words of Kipling, inscribed on war memorials across the British Commonwealth, and wrote on that Anzac Day, lest we forget Manos, Nauru, Syria, Palestine. Manos and Nauru are the islands where would-be illegal immigrants to Australia are detained. Uh, Syria, well, I suppose that's the civil war. And Palestine, well, they're the house pets of uh, Western lefties. But it's appropriating the sacrifice of others for your cause, which is boorish and unseemly and vulgar, to say the least. Miss Abdul Magid didn't like it when Aussies complained about that, so she said, screw you, Australia, I'm out of here. And she moved. Uh, back to Sudan? Oh, no, actually, to London. London, England, that is, not London, Kiribati. And for a while, she told interviewers here how much better life was in the UK than among those ghastly ockers down under. And she joked about cutting up her Australian passport. And then came the Platinum Jubilee, and all that flag-waving triggered poor old Yasmin, and she reverted to type. Quote... There are Union Jacks everywhere. It's like a waking nightmare. I think that should be walking nightmare, but either way, it's a nightmare. Now, just to be clear, she spent almost all her life in Australia. Here's the Australian flag, if you're not familiar with it. Yes, there we are, the old Southern Cross. Uh, and uh, that's the Australian flag. She was born in uh, Sudan. Until 1956, this was the Sudanese flag. May not be quite as familiar to you as the Australian. Yeah, there's the uh, Sudanese flag. That's this week's round of Know Your Ensigns. There'll be a test at the end. So she and her family have lived under the Union flag in one form or another their entire lives, yet she regards it as a nightmare but can't stop moving to countries that fly it. Our pal Alexandra Marshall joins us from the Spectator's Australian HQ. What do you make of your fellow Australian, Alexandra? Well, look, Mark, given that Australia is no longer allowed to grow food because of our net zero goals, we've decided that our primary export to the UK is going to be screechy activists. You know, it's sort of a renewable source of outrage. <laughs> no, look, we kind of oh, wish yeah. she'd cut up her Australian passport because you can keep her. It's been lovely and peaceful down here since she's been gone. But this is so typical of these uh, young activists. She's come to Australia. She's had such a terrible time here that uh, Queensland made her young queen of the year in 2010, Young Muslim of the Year in 2010, and then Queenslander of the Year in 2015. So a, a really, really terrible, oppressive country that we are. And then she was appointed as a sort of ambassador for Arab-Australian relations, where our government flew her around the, uh, the Arab countries to sort of sell Australia, which, given how much offence she's managed to cause in both Australia and the UK, I'm not sure how that went. And then when her whole career collapsed, mm. the Australian government gave her 20 grand to go and write in Paris. So we are clearly the most oppressive and horrible country that has ever existed. And, uh, yeah, so welcome to the UK. Uh, I hope she's having a good time. Yeah, I don't know how much longer people are expected to put up with it. You know, uh, we all know everything that works in Sudan uh, is, the, is the legacy of imperialism from before 1956, and everything that doesn't work is the stuff all the military coup crackpots have done since the British skiaddled, skidaddled out of there. I'm just, that's a, free, that's a free one from me, Ofcom, just a bonus complaint to add to the long list. Um, but we all know that to be true. The traffic is only one way. There is no big Australian community in Khartoum. Why, why do we even entertain, you know, the Sudanese move to Australia, nobody moves from Queensland to Sudan. Why do we persist in taking this kind of rubbish seriously? Oh, look, there's plenty of oppression in Queensland, let's be fair. Anastasia Palaszczuk, the Premier's, was pretty bad during COVID. But there's plenty of material mm. that she could pick apart for the Sudan if she wanted to. But, you know, your uh, viewers may know, uh, Yasmin, from such quotes as, uh, Sharia law is about mercy and kindness, and Islam is the most feminist mm. religion. Well, although I guess that they do mm. know what a woman is, so we have to give them that one. 
But, you know, I suffered so that yeah. you don't have to, Mark. I went and actually read the transcript for her I'm So Oppressed speech. And uh, just so we know the quality of writer that we're paying a fortune for, she has written about the grief of losing her previous career, you know, mostly through her own commentary, where she mm. wrote, It poured out of my fingers and soaked these pages like rainwater in a drought-soaked desert. And my personal favourite, I now think of the death of baby Yasmina as a controlled burn in the tradition of the First Nations people, the, the real custodians of this land. I mean, it's like victimhood paint by numbers. Hmm. Yeah, th this is crazy. But, but, but it's like, it's really, oh, oh, yeah, I'm being oppressed in Australia. Australia. So I need to escape Australian oppression. Where can I go? Oh, what's this place? The United Kingdom? Uh, that sounds like a complete break from Australian style suppression. I mean, why do she we has more this rights is crazy? Than I do. Why doesn't. She <laughs> I, I can't escape to the UK if I wanted to because I'm not vaccinated. So I'm trapped here. I, I am actually oppressed by the Australian mm. government. But uh, Yasmin's not. Yasmin's free to leave and, and come and go as she likes. Well, uh, I'm sure that one or other of our wretched political parties are going to be putting this woman uh, in, in, uh, into a safe seat and uh, she'll, she'll be in the imperial parliament and be able to tell us all to, uh, to stuff it from a national platform soon enough. Uh, whatever you, what, that threat you made to send us even more of your Australian activists, don't. Don't. I preferred, I preferred Earl's Court in the old days. It was a better quality of Australian than, than we're, we're getting these days. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I'm going to... I think that's outrageous you can't come to the United Kingdom. And uh, I'm going to see if I can uh, speak to someone and do that, uh, do, uh, and do something about that. And we'll get Australia House to throw a big party for you. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. It's always good to see you. Coming up, Stump the Stein. Uh, that's GB Views at GBNews.uk. Plus, are you one of those eco activists who think we need a lot of fewer people on Earth? Well, it's happening. We've got more corpses at one end and fewer babies at the other. Jamie Jenkins is next. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. Here's a point I made en passant the other night, but it bears repeating. For many Western nations, early 2022 
has seen a catastrophic drop-off in baby births. Germany already has deathbed demographics. But 2022 so far is a unique scale of disaster. Look uh, at this on the uh, right-hand end of the graph. That's uh, the way it's gone down as opposed to the same period in previous years. Same thing in Switzerland. Let's take a look at the uh, Swiss graph here. Again, see the same thing, uh, equivalent period in uh, other years, it's significantly lower. Same thing in uh, Norway. Uh, first quarter Norway births, 2018, 15,000 plus, 2019, 15,000 plus, 2020, 15,000 plus, 2021, 15,000 plus, 2022, Oh, 12,000. What could cause such a drop-off? Well, it happened in all these countries basically nine months after the rollout of the COVID vaccine. Oh, don't go there, girlfriend. You sound like one of them conspiracy nutters. By contrast, just as the maternity wards are emptying out, the mortuaries are getting a little crowded with what they call excess deaths and not from COVID. When we want to run the numbers, we turn to Jamie Jenkins, formerly of the Office for National Statistics. Jamie, uh, excess deaths, is it a thing or not? Well, Mark, it is a thing at the moment. And we talked briefly on it last week where we had the, the May figures from the ONS and we could see that deaths were running above average. Mm -hmm. And that's when you take out all the deaths that the, the medical practitioner had reckoned said that COVID was a part of it. And the latest figures that we've got for June now in the last week, we've seen about 10,844 deaths across England and Wales. And if we compare how many you would expect to see in this week by looking at similar weeks over the period, say, before the pandemic, that's about 1,427 above average. Now, we know that there are still some deaths happening in society which are related to COVID. We had 161 out of those 10,000 and, and eight, uh, in terms of the deaths that were due to COVID and, and fewer, about 103 where COVID was mentioned on the list. So we stripped those out. We've still got, Mark, you know, 1,160 deaths in one week alone now, in the latest week in England and Wales, above average, which cannot be explained by anything related to COVID. And, and the thing is, we've got lots of, the, you know, the mainstream media talking about rising infection rates across England and Wales at the moment. And, and we know that with this new Omicron variant, they're far less deadly, but it's plastered all over the news. You, you had Jonathan Van Tam interviewed on the BBC on the week, uh, a few days ago, talking about these new figures. He was saying, don't, no alarm. He still doesn't wear masks. But nobody's really talking about these excess deaths. We were talking about excess deaths when we were seeing them because of COVID. But it's just as important when you've got these excess deaths for other factors. Now, the ONS, when they publish the weekly figures, don't look at it in terms of cause, but we will get a bit more insight into these, like we did for the May figures. In about a month's time, we'll get a bit more insight in terms of the June figures. And it was heart disease was one of the factors in May. And is it a case of what we touched on last week, Mark, that staying home, protecting the NHS has meant that you've not protected yourself and we're seeing people dying of other causes because of these long waiting lists and people not getting diagnosed with certain certain conditions. Well, as stat statisticians certainly know, uh, a correlation is not causation. Nevertheless, this is a high enough excess death rate, uh, not just in England and Wales, but elsewhere, uh, within Her Majesty's dominions, that it's surprising that uh, w w there's more publicity given to some virtually harmless Omicron variant than an actual health crisis for whatever reason. No, indeed, because if, you, if you know, we're seeing all of the, you've got your usual suspects in the UK, Mark, so you've got independent stage, so what that group is, it's a group of kind of people who've come together, um, they weren't, um, the government didn't want to listen to them, so they weren't on SAGE throughout the pandemic. And we know what some people would think about SAGE with the pandemic. So they set themselves up as this independent version of SAGE. And they've just constantly been mm -hmm. kind of doom-mongering and calling for more and more restrictions all of the time. And if you look at the facts and figures and, and, and look at it in terms of, you know, some, some common, look at it and with some common sense in terms of all this, Mark. In Wales at the moment, we've got 40 patients out of 9,260 9, beds who are in Wales hospitals because of COVID. 
if you look at England in terms of critical care beds, it'll run a quarter of this time last year. They've hardly moved, and there's 52 patients out mm -hmm. of over 4,000 beds. But what you see, Mark, is that these people who want to kind of scare the public, we had Jeremy Vine putting out videos saying, why aren't the government doing things? Why aren't they locking people down? They focus on the infection rates. Now, a lot of people I know have got COVID, but there's, you know, there's very little wrong with them. In fact, they know very few people yeah. who've never had COVID now in terms of where we are. They focus on those numbers, but do we see the headlines on the front of the newspapers or on the mainstream media about these, you know, these thousands of deaths that are occurring above average? We don't, Mark. And I think you know, the ONS themselves should be looking at this in terms of the causes of these deaths because we need to know what's going on because if there's if it's a common theme mm. happening, we need to address that, don't we? Well, absolutely. What do you make of these? Again, correlation is not causation. It could just be because uh, people are a bit, as you say, people are depressed because they've been locked down, they've been living alone in their flats and whatever. What do you make of this? these figures showing significant uh, lowering, uh, fewer births in, uh, in 2022 so far than there were in the five previous years, as I said, in multiple European com countries. We may not know what it is, but something's up, isn't it? Well, yeah, we know over the long term, Mark, that we've been seeing declining birth rates across many countries. In 2021, some countries saw an increase in birth rate. That might have been people locked down, didn't have a lot to do, conceived some, some babies. But these numbers and the charts that you've looked at, I did look at the German numbers myself a couple of days ago. You know, These are mm. the official figures that are being published by the national statistics agencies in those countries. Mm. And, and you're right, you can't say one thing causes another. But what it would do as a statistician for me, and this is what the government should be mm. doing with their agencies is you, it's not good just publishing numbers because numbers you know they, they only tell mm. you part of the story you've got to investigate and look into the reasons why and that's the thing now i think what's missing i was looking to see when we get the, the results in england and wales around june last year we got some figures from the ons looking at the first quarter of 2021 because they were looking at the covid pandemic i can't see any release date for anything there but i think it would be interesting to see yeah. if we're seeing the same phenomenon in England and Wales. But I think regardless of the cause of it, whatever that is, people will speculate on what the cause is. There needs to be some investigation and some answers into this so people can be reassured into what is behind the cause of all of these figures. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. I would like it if we had more uh, statistics in some of these fields from the Office for National Statistics. It certainly bears investigation because it's not there. Uh, something's getting us coming and going, births and deaths. And it would be interesting to know why that's happening. Thank you, Jamie. It's always good to see you. In our closing moment, this is a quick stumpy stump. Uh, Louise <laughs> says, has Boris Johnson morphed into a liberal Democrat? Louise, you're not keeping up. It's way worse than that. I saw some uh, thing, I think it was in The Spectator the other day, in which uh, somebody was claiming that, in fact, the Conservatives were far more conservative when they were in coalition with the Liberal Democrats a decade ago than they actually are now. Uh, uh, what else we got here? Louise. Uh, no, that was Louise. Titch says, is there such a thing as toxic femininity? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, you know there is. And it's not all just those uh, transitioning psycho transgender crime wave that we've been uh, reporting on a few months ago. That is going to do it from us. Mark Dolan is in for Dan Wooden to wallop your Wednesday. I've just been warming up the Christian name for him. Here is the real Mark. What you got, Mark? Another brilliant show. Thank you, Mark. Uh, well, look, we're going to be looking in the clash at whether women make better leaders. That is a suggestion of none other than our male Prime Minister, <laughs> Boris Johnson, who said that uh, uh. the monster Putin is actually simply demonstrating uh, toxic masculinity. Mm. So we'll debate whether women mm. would make better leaders in the company of Christine Hamilton, Leilani Dowding and Lady Colin Campbell, given the fact that, of course, Jacinda Ardern, the uh, Kiwi Mussolini mm. and Nicola Sturgeon are both women, yes. I beg to differ. A busy show. Back to you, Mark. Uh, we'll look forward to I think MI6 should be parachuted into Moscow to inject Putin with some hormones that will have him transitioning into a woman. That's the only way to bring this war to an end. All coming up after the weather. Stay safe, stay free. Hello, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. 
Further rain or showers expected in many places overnight and throughout much of Thursday. Some clearer spells in between, but it's going to stay cool. At the moment, low pressure is in charge. That low pressure is sitting towards the northwest of the UK. Wrapped around it are a number of occluded fronts. These providing the focus for longer spells of rain or heavier showers at times over the next 24 hours. So even after dark, we're going to see some showers continuing. And in fact, in the far south and southeast of England through the evening and then into North Sea coastal counties, perhaps some more prolonged rain at times. Away from there, showers continuing, perhaps some heavy downpours, particularly western coast.